Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 90, the final episode in this exciting and mind-blowing miniseries on the arthropods. This is also the finale to the larger series on the protostome side of the animal kingdom. And today's episode is going to be quite fun, because we're going to explore the enormous taxonomy and all of the phylogenetic relationships of a particular subphylum. And this particular subphylum is the most biodiverse clade of animals on the planet. There is no other comparable subphylum that even comes close. It's estimated that of all of the known eukaryotic species on the planet, the insects make up roughly half of them. And as the most biodiverse clade, they are also arguably the most ecologically important as their raw biodiversity means that they fill an incomparable number of ecological niches, and they provide an unparalleled number and quality of ecological services to the rest of the Earth's biosphere. So who are these hexapods, these six-legged arthropods that are so important to the world's ecosystems? Well, among the hexapoda, there are four major divisions. Columbola, Protura, Diplura, and most famous of all, the Ectonatha, which you might also know as the Insecta, or the insects. Now, all of the bugs in Columbola, Protura, and Diplura are wingless. They cannot fly, and all of them are bound to the ground. Furthermore, they all possess simple tubular bodies, with six legs and a pair of antennae which they use to sense and feel out the granular terrestrial world in which they live. Earlier taxonomic organization had brushed them all together under the umbrella endonatha, as they all have mouth parts that are mounted inside of their head. This particular physiological detail distinguishes them from the ectonatha, which have external mouth parts. All right, so now let's take a closer look at each of these groups. The columbola, or the springtails, are very small but ubiquitous animals that spend their time in the decaying vegetable matter and leaf litter that can be found in forests, grasslands, and, well, pretty much virtually every terrestrial habitat with vegetation. The springtails are omnivores, who will munch on and mechanically break down both plants and animal detritus. Within the columbola, there are four orders, the entomobryomorpha, the Poduromorpha, the Symphopleona, and this last one is kind of disputed, the Neolipleona. Now, all of these orders are pretty similar, ecologically and physiologically speaking, but they have slight, subtle morphological differences that allow you to tell them apart. For example, the Entomobryomorpha are relatively narrow little bugs with bodies shaped like elongated ovals with well-defined forked tails. These include the 20 species of little pale Cyphodera springtails of the Paranellidae family and the 700 species of heavily scaled, colorful, slender springtails of the Entomobriidae, which can be found in the tree canopy of forests in the northern hemisphere. The Podura morpha are also oval-shaped, but they're not as long or slender. They're much stubbier and more robust. The Podura morpha are also characterized by having short, stubby legs, and a short, flat, forked tail. The Symphopleona are even rounder and chubbier, shaped like little marbles or spheres. And to make up for this bumbling body shape, they have relatively long antennae, which allows them to extend the range of their immediate sensory perception. The last springtail order is the Neolipleona, although, like I said, their placement is debated. Some scientists will argue that the uh, Neolipleona are their own order, while other scientists argue that they are instead a subclade of Symphopleona. But in any case, they're a small group of small little bugs, and among their ranks there's the Megalothorax genus, whose species are an unusually bright, transparent orange. Recent molecular analysis has found that the sister lineage to the Columbola are the Protura, so these are the most closely related groups to each other. Like the Columbola, these are very small bugs that live in the soil, in the leaf litter, and under the bark of trees in temperate forests. Not only do they have no wings, they also have no eyes, 
no antenna, and many of them lack pigment, making them a pale, translucent white, or at best, a tan or light brownish color. Interestingly, their mouthparts suggest that they're fluid feeders, who suck the juices out of fungal mycelia. Even though there's seven families and approximately 800 species of proturin, they're surprisingly poorly understood. They're so tiny that they went unnoticed for almost all of human history, having only been discovered in the 20th century. The total range, preferred habitat, and life strategy of many of these bugs is also not well understood. What little we do know is that the Hesperontomidae and the Protentomidae families appear to have representative species across Eurasia. The three species in the Anteliantomon family live in the tropics of Southeast Asia. The two species of the Fujiantomon and the three species of the Sinentomon families live in China, Korea, and Japan. And the Eosentomidae family, which includes the huge Eosentomon genus with over 300 species, has a worldwide distribution. The last Proturin family, a Serentomidae, is by far the largest in terms of the number of genera. I won't exhaustively list them all because it would be really tedious and this is already going to be a very exhaustive taxonomic episode, but instead I'll just share with you a neat fact about them. Virtually every species in the hexapoda is tracheated, which means they have a series of tubes called trachea running through their body. Oxygen from the atmosphere diffuses through little pores called spiracles, which then makes its way into the tracheal network. This oxygen will flow through these tracheal tubes to oxygenate and diffuse into all of the internal tissues of the hexapod's body. It's how they respirate, it's how they breathe. But the Acerantomidae are an exception in that they don't have trachea. Instead, to breathe, they simply diffuse oxygen directly across an external layer of tissue called a cuticle. For this to work, the animal has to be extremely small. So small, in fact, that the oxygen can readily diffuse across its tissues at sufficient levels to keep all of its cells alive. It should come as no surprise, then, that the mini genera of Acerantomidae are very, very small. All right, so both the columbola and the protura, these small, generally pale, soil-dwelling, leaf-litter-dwelling, omnivorous scavenging hexapods, they all exist as sister lineages on one branch of this hexapod family tree. But there's another branch of the hexapod family tree, and it too diverged or split into two smaller branches or two smaller sublineages. In this other branch of hexapods, the, uh, the smaller subbranch is the diplura, or the two-pronged bristletails. This two-pronged feature mentioned in the name, the, the di part of diplura, these are called circi. They're a pair of antenna-like structures that protrude from the tip of the tail. And as you'll soon hear, the circi have taken on a wide variety of forms and functions. The diplura includes some 10 families, and 800 species of mostly blind, wingless bugs with long, narrow bodies, and they too live in the soil and the leaf litter. However, they're not predominantly herbivores or scavengers, but instead, like the centipedes, who also have the two strange appendages coming off their telson, their rear body segment, many of these diplura are active predators. A great example can be found in the 70 genera of the aggressive, dangerous, and predatory Japigidae family, whose Circe structures have evolved into fearsome pincers, which they use to capture prey. Some of the larger and more interesting families of Diplurans are the Projapigidae and the Enajapigidae, both of whom have Circe that are short, broad, and stiffly rigid. And in the case of the Enajapigidae, they're known to secrete abdominal juices to help break down detritus for scavenging. In contrast, there's other families, like the Campodiidae, that possess Circe that are long and flexible. And more than a quarter of all Diplurin species belong to this Campodiidae family. Other Diplurin families are quite small and discreet, such as the Dingepigidae family, which contains just one genus and six species. 
And there's also the Octostigmidae family, with one genus and only three species. And that about sums it up for all of the Entanatha, or the, the more basal lineages of the hexapods. Now, I should explain that, that the term Entonatha has really fallen out of favor, as it was developed using morphological analysis, mainly focusing on the presence of internal mouth parts. But more recent genetic analysis has found that these three groups, the Columbola, the Protura, and the Diplura, are paraphyletic and not monophyletic. In other words, the actual genetic relationship is much more complex than the study of morphological mouthpart features would suggest, and their natural history appears to be interwoven with the insects. This is a nice segue into the most recently diverged group of hexapods, which will be the subject of the rest of the episode. This is the class Ectonatha, or the insects, and there are three large divisions in this clade the Archeonatha, or the jumping bristletails, and the Zygentoma, or the silverfish, which together make up the wingless insects. And the third group is the Pterogoda, or the winged insects. The Pterogoda are further divided into the more basal Paleoptera, or the old-winged insects, and the more recently derived Neoptera, or the new-winged insects. We'll get into all of these groups, especially the Pterogoda, in a much more detail. All right, so with that said, let's start with the most basal insects of them all, the ones most closely related to all of the other lineages that we've already covered. These are the Archeonatha, or the jumping bristletails. And like their older cousins, the two-pronged bristletails, these jumping bristletails have two cerci, but they also possess a much longer central structure called an epiproc. They can use this long epiproct as a lever to spring themselves up, allowing them to jump about a foot into the air, hence the name, jumping bristletails. The group is divided into two families. The much larger family, Machilidae, includes some 250 scale-covered species that live along rocky coastal and riparian areas. The smaller family, Minertelidae, contains just 20 species, which can be distinguished by their lack of iridescent scales along the base of their legs and antenna. The next wingless insect group is Zygentoma, or the silverfish, which, like the jumping bristletails, also possess the three tail appendages, the, uh, the two uh, primordial cerci and the more derived epiproct. A big difference here is that in the jumping bristletails, the epiproct is much longer than the cerci. But in the silverfish, the cerci and the epiproct are roughly the same length. Now within the zygentoma, there's five families of wildly unequal size. For example, there's the Lepidotrichidae family, which is as small as it gets with just one extant species, the Tricholepidion gertschii, which can be found in the forests of northern California. Similarly, the Mandroneidae family is also really small, with just one genus containing four species, which all live in extremely dry areas, such as Iran, Sudan, the Arabian Peninsula, and the remarkably arid Atacama Desert in Chile. The Protrinomuridae family has four genera, and at least four species, but probably more. The Nicolaidae is a medium-sized family with 12 genera of small, pale, dirt-dwelling bugs that prefer to live under the surface of the soil, deep in piles of plant detritus, or in the dark depths of a cave. The Lepismatidae family, on the other hand, is the largest silverfish family, with an estimated 190 to over 200 species found all over the world. Many of them have adapted to live in human environments, such as cities and buildings. Within this diverse Lepismatidae family, there are the most representative members of the Zygentoma, namely the species Lepisma saccharine, or the, the titular silverfish, with its gray-silver scales and fish-like body movements. But you also have uh, groups and species like the Thermobia domestica firebrat, which prefers warm areas, be they decomposing piles of leaf litter in the wilderness, or everything from boiler rooms to bakeries in human cities. 
So that's about it for the wingless insects. Now it's time to turn our attention to the winged insects of the Pteragoda and its two constituent infraclasses, Heliotera and Neotera. Before we get into this, I should clarify that the phylogenetics of these groups, of all of them, uh, pretty much all of the insects, but especially these groups, are still being debated to some degree. For example, recent genetic evidence suggests the Paleotera may not be monophyletic, and within the Neotera, the exact relationships between the various clades are, are not exactly clear, and they're currently being worked out. So with this ambiguity taken into consideration, I'll basically be trying to take a look at the known monophyletic clusters within the Paleotera and the Neotera. This way, I can break down the colossal insect biodiversity into more manageable bite-sized chunks, and it should all flow a bit smoother and make a bit more sense. But keep in mind that even with this attempt at efficiency, there's honestly no way for me to exhaustively list everything. If I were to list off every family in every order within the Insecta class and give them, you know, a sentence or two description, well, this episode would probably end up being multiple hours long, like five or six hours long. So for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to list off every family, or even most families. Instead, I'm only going to mention some of the most significant families, those with famous species, or a large number of species, or those that have weird and exotic species, that kind of thing. This way, I can keep things interesting without getting too bogged down in the details of dozens of families of a particular insecta order. So without further ado, let's dive into it, starting with the more basal clades. The Paleotera contains ten major clades, but eight of them have gone extinct. The two remaining clades, both of which have a truly ancient origin, are the Ephemerotera, or the Mayflies, and the Odonata, or the Damselflies and the Dragonflies. Both of these groups still retain a handful of traits from their early evolutionary history, such as large wings that don't fold over the abdomen, and very long, segmented tails. The Ephemerotera order contains 42 families, 400 genera, and more than 3,000 species. These mayflies are large but short-lived insects. They can be found in freshwater habitats around the world. And according to Peters and Campbell's 1991 catalog, Insects of Australia, there are six superfamilies of mayflies. The Betoidea superfamily is perhaps the most ancient mayfly lineage, and includes about a thousand species in the Betoidea family. And these are among some of the physically smallest mayflies. The Sinoidea superfamily is characterized by the fact that their larvae have filamentous gills, and include among their ranks many rather small species of mayflies, which prefer to live in the silt and mud at the bottom of a slow-moving or still body of water. The Sinoidea superfamily also includes a particularly interesting group. Uh, these are the, the armored mayflies of the Beticidae family. And then there's also the spiny crawler mayflies of the Ephemeralidae superfamily. These have an Atlantic distribution, existing across North America and the United Kingdom. The superfamilies Ephemeraloidea and Ephemeridia can be found all over the world, except in the Arctic, Antarctica, and Australia. The Heptagenioidea and the Leptophlebiidae superfamilies also have a similar range, but they have successfully spread to Australia. Now the other order of Paleoterran insects are the Odonata, or the Damselflies and the Dragonflies. These large insects are all carnivores, feeding exclusively on the smaller insects they find in the air, on the land, and near the water. It's actually really rather interesting. Because the dragonflies and the damselflies are such universally effective predators, with something like a 95-98% like a hunting efficiency rate, they're kind of an evolutionary relic. They've retained the same basic body plan and life strategy in hunting behaviors of their ancient ancestors from many hundreds of millions of years ago. This means that the Odonata are kind of like the sharks of the insect world. The damselflies, or the Zygotera, are the more basal of these two groups, 
similar to dragonflies, except just smaller and narrower. There's currently 18 monophyletic damselfly families, and these include, among many others, the Paralestidae family, known for their short, stubby wings and their long, thin tails, which live in the dense jungles of Mezzo and South America. And then there's the shadow damsels of the Platystictidae family, the metallic-colored gossamer wings of the Euphiidae family, the large, beautifully iridescent, river-dwelling jewel wings of the Caloterigidae family, and the largest damselfly family of them all, with some 1,300 species with a global distribution, is the Cenagrionidae. The other Odonata group are the true dragonflies of the infraorder Anisotera. Now this is probably my favorite group of insects. The dragonflies are just super cool. They are so badass. They're giant bugs. They look awesome. They have incredible colors. They're named after dragons. And they don't take shit from any other bug. They eat virtually every other insect they come across. That is brutal and hardcore and super badass. But I'll try to make sure that my bias <laughs> doesn't affect my description of the dragonflies. Okay, anyways, within Anisotera, there are 11 families. Some of the notable families include the Corduleidae, or the, the emerald dragonflies, which refers to their iridescent emerald green eyes. Then there's also the Cordulogastridae, or the spike tails, referring to the large, sharp ovipositors on the end of their tails, and the Libellulidae family, which is the largest family in terms of species in the world, with a global distribution. The Eshnidae and the Ostropitaliidae families include many of the larger, beefier dragonflies, with the largest dragonfly species of them all, the Australian Petaluma ingentissima, with its 160 mm or 6.3 inch wingspan, that monstrosity belongs to the oldest dragonfly family, Petaluridae. Alright, so that was our run through of the Paleotera, the old winged insects. Now let's turn our attention to the newer and more derived lineages of the Neotera. This group is an order of magnitude more diverse than the Paleotera so I'll be skimming through it at an even faster clip. Just to illustrate the difference here, where Paleotera has two orders that are still alive, two orders that still exist, Ephemerotera and Odonata, the Neotera, in contrast, have more than two dozen extant orders. First, let's go over some of the more basal groups. Perhaps the most basal are the more than 3,500 species of stoneflies of the Plicotera order. Unlike their more ancient dragonfly cousins, the stoneflies are not strong flyers, and many species, such as Capnia lacustra, have lost their wings entirely. Among the 15 plus stonefly families, some of the more notable ones include the cold-tolerant winter stoneflies of the Capneidae and Teneoterigidae families, the huge Perlidae family with more than 1,100 species, and the giant stoneflies of the Pteronarciidae family, known for their ecological importance as a food source for salmon. The next most basal insect orders are the termites and cockroaches of the Blatodia order and the mantises of the Mantidea order. Some notable clades among these families of Blatodia include the cave-dwelling Noctocolidae, the desert-dwelling sand cockroaches of the Caridiidae family, the giant cockroaches of the biodiverse Blaridae family, the crop-destroying harvester termites of the Hodotermidae family, the house-infesting cockroaches of the Ectobiidae and Blatidae families, and the dry wood destroying termites of the Termididae, Calotermididae, and Rhinotermididae families, which are all notorious pests that weaken and destroy wooden structures in human societies across the world. The Mantidea order includes over 2,400 species of mantids and more than 20 families, which are a particularly awesome group of insects. In my opinion, these are the coolest bugs second to the dragonflies. Mantids, or mantises, are super cool, with their, their pinching saw-like forearms. They're just awesome, but we'll get into this. 
The most characteristic features of these large bugs are their triangular heads with wide-set bulbous eyes and their enlarged forearms, adapted for grabbing and ensnaring prey. Some of the notable mantid families include the long, green, slender mantids of the Coptoterygidae family, the plant-mimicking mantids of the Ampucidae family, which are fearsome-looking ambush hunters, the flower-mimicking mantids of the Hymenopodidae family, which are brightly colored and beautiful flower-mimicking ambush hunters, the sand-colored desert-dwelling mantids of the Aramiophilidae family, the bulbous, iridescent, metallic-colored mantids of the Metalaticidae family, and the most iconic of them all, the praying mantids of the largest mantid family, Mantidae. The next basal clade is the Orthoterra order, which includes some 20,000 species of grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. Some notable Orthoterra families include the scaly crickets, the wood crickets, and the so-called true crickets of the Griloidea superfamily, the nocturnal cave crickets of the Raphidophoridae family, the katydids of the Tetagonlidae family, the desert-dwelling dune crickets of the Schizodactylidae family, the tropical Eumestacoidea and Pergomorphidae families, the African bladder grasshoppers of the Pneumoridae family, and the iconic, globally distributed, classic grasshoppers of the Acridoidea family. A particularly exotic and fascinating insect order is the Phasmatodia, also known as the stick bugs and leaf bugs. Their evolutionary trajectory saw them adapt to their forest environments by achieving an incredibly accurate morphological mimicry of the parts of local plants, like their branches and their leaves. These stick and leaf bugs include the small Agathemerodia suborder, native to the mountains of South America, the Timomatidae family of Western North America, and the colossally numerous and biodiverse Veraphasmatodia suborder, which includes among its many families the most basal bugs of the Timomatidae family, the tropical stick bugs of the Prizopodidae family, and the stunningly beautiful and convincingly leaf-like insects of the Phileidae family, which live from India across Southeast Asia and the Malaysian archipelago all the way down to Australia. The last of the basal Neoterran clades is the Embiotera, or the web spinners. It's a relatively small clade, whose species tend to live in communities in webs made of silk. Some notable Embioteran families include the Oligotomidae, which prefer more arid environments, the Teratembiidae family, which mostly prefer tropical and more humid environments, and the relatively large and biodiverse Embiidae and Anisembiidae families. Beyond these more basal orders, we come to some of the more derived and intermediate orders, such as the Zoroterra and the superorder Paraneotera. The Zoroterran order is pretty small, with just 44 extant species. These so-called angel insects are small and unassuming with most of the species preferring to hang out inside of rotting logs and leaf litter in tropical and subtropical forests, where they can feast on fungus and organic detritus to their heart's content. The Paraneoterran superorder is much more diverse. It includes four constituent orders. These are the thrips of the Thysinotera, the lice of the Phthiraterra, the bark lice of the Socotera, and the so-called true bugs of the Hematera. So, starting at the top of the list, the thrips of the Thysanotera order are very small bugs, with strange and asymmetrical mouthparts. A small handful of its some 6,000 species are carnivores, but the vast majority of them are fluid feeders, which puncture the plant's tissues to suck up the sugar-rich phloem and the mineral-rich water in the xylem. These thrips are major pest animals. They damage crops and ruin greenhouses. Some notable families include the Aleothripidae, which are carnivores that prefer to live on flowers and eat the insects and other small arthropods that come by, the Fleothripidae family, where most of its 3,400 species are tropical fungus eaters, and the Euzelothripidae family, which possesses just a single extant species. 
The Fathira Terra order contains some 5,000 species of lice, which are also very tiny insects, but they're also disease-carrying, obligate parasites that live on warm-blooded hosts, like birds and most mammals. The lice feed on their host, eating their hair, their feathers, their skin, their oils and body fluids, and even their blood. The lice of the Amblycera suborder chew on their host's skin and drink up the blood, and the lice of the Anaplura suborder feed exclusively on their host's blood. The Ishnocera suborder feeds on the feathers of birds, but some species parasitize lemurs. The lice of the Hematomizidae family parasitize elephants and warthogs, using their powerful drill-like mouthparts to burrow through the thick hide of their host. Related to this Phthiraterra order is the Socaterra order, also known as the bark lice. Instead of parasitizing warm-blooded animals, the bark lice live under the bark of trees, where they eat exposed plant tissues, as well as fungus and lichen. Some groups of note include the Cylipsosidae family of cave-dwelling bark lice, the Lepidopscoidea family of scaly-winged bark lice, and the Socomorpha and Troctomorpha suborders, which include many species of book lice known to chew on the paper of old books. Last in the Paraneoterra superorder are the true bugs of the order Hemitera. This is a very large and extremely diverse clade that can be divided into four suborders. Coleoranca, Sternoranca, Ocenoranca, and Heterotera. Again, because of the raw biodiversity, I'm only going to briefly mention some of the more famous or interesting clades. But because Hemitera is so biodiverse, at this point, I'm really engaging in some egregious acts of omission to keep these lists succinct and timely. So the humble Coleoranca suborder includes one small living family, the Peloridiidae, or the moss bugs, which can be found in scattered habitats across South America, Australia, New Zealand, and Oceania, where they crawl around the forest feeding on moss. The Sternoranca suborder is dominated by plant parasites, including the scale insects of the Cocoidea superfamily, the pine and spruce aphids of the Phylloxeroidea superfamily, and the evolutionarily young but enormous and very diverse Amphididae family, which includes all manner of aphids, such as the subterranean root-eating aphids of the Enoceanae subfamily. The Aphidinae family is notorious for spreading viruses among their plant hosts. And the Ariosoma atini family of woolly aphids, who produce a waxy white secretion on the plant that resembles wool, and which provides them with some mechanical protection. The Akinoranca is another very diverse group of herbivores, infamous for their tendency to spread plant viruses and fungal parasites among their hosts. They include many families of frog hoppers and spittle bugs, which create nests of frothy foam inside of moss or on plants. Many families of tree hoppers and leaf hoppers, including the very diverse Deridae family and the bizarre looking plant mimics of the Membracidae family, the brightly colored tropical lanternflies of the Fulgoridae family, and the cicadas of the Cicadidae family, and their, their primitive hairy cicada cousins and the Tetagarctidae family. The last Hemeteran group is the Heteroterra suborder of true bugs, which is also huge and wildly diverse. Some of their more famous members are the water striders of the Geromorpha infraorder, the frightful carnivorous true water bugs of the Nepomorpha, the obnoxious stink bugs and exotic flat bugs of the Pentatomomorpha infraorder, and the parasitic pirate bugs, assassin bugs, and bed bugs of the Simicomorpha infraorder. Simicomorpha is a huge group that comprises more than 90% of all hemateran species. All right, now we're starting to get into some of the more derived Neoterran groups. Many of these more recent and more derived clades are really diverse and really fascinating and just exceptionally cool. For example, consider the twisted wing parasites of the Strepsotera order. These creepy bugs have one of the most hardcore lifestyles I've ever seen. The female will burrow into the body of a larger insect, 
leaving her genitals poking out of the host. A male, who usually only lives for a few hours, will approach and mate with her as she's half buried in the host. When the eggs hatch, instead of eating the host, they'll eat their own mother, and then burst out of the host through the mother's exposed genital region, and then they'll seek new hosts to do it all over again. That's the most hardcore insect lifestyle I think I've ever read about. Anyway, there's also the snake flies of the Raphidiotera order, which are territorial carnivores that live in the bark of tropical trees, and which feed on a wide variety of smaller insects and arachnids, basically anything that's unfortunate enough to share their habitat. One of the largest clades of all the insects, indeed of all the animals on the planet, is the order Coleotera, also known as the beetles. To give you an impression of just how diverse the beetles are, think about this. Of all of the insect species in the world, which make up about half of all eukaryotic animal species, about 40% of all the insects are beetles. Of all the eukaryotic animals in the world, about a quarter of them, or one in every four, is a beetle. They inhabit every habitat except the watery oceans and the icy poles. They include herbivores, fungivores, detrivores, and carnivores. The beetles distinguish themselves by the fact that their first pair of wings have hardened into a shell-like wing casing called elytra. Some of the more well-known and characteristic clades of beetles include the metallic-colored scarab beetles of the Scarabiidae family, including the Scarabia sacer dung beetle, which was celebrated in ancient Egyptian mythology and artwork, the iridescent wood-boring jewel beetles of the Buprestidae family, the crop-destroying weevils of the Circulionoidea family, the skin beetles of the Dermestidae family, which are famous flesh-eating scavengers often used in forensic science to clean meat off of bones, the beautiful and charismatic aphid-eating ladybugs of the Coccinellidae family, the unique longhorn beetles of the Cerambycidae family, which are named after the extremely long, thick antenna present in most of the family's species, and the ship timber beetles of the Lamexilidae family, which have a unique and extremely fascinating symbiotic relationship with fungi. One of my favorite beetle species is the Dynasties Hercules, or the Hercules beetle. It is an extraordinarily strong insect, believed to be able to move more than 800 times its body weight. And that's super impressive, as it's one of the largest flying insects in the world. And among the beetles, it's also one of the longest. This is because the male possesses a titanic thoracic horn that it uses to fight other males for access to mates. Including the horn, the Hercules beetle can grow to be over 170 millimeters, or 7 inches long. And for a refresher and a neat comparison, that's about as long, a little bit longer actually, as the wingspan of the largest living dragonfly. All right, everyone, we are nearing the end of this analysis of the hexapoda. We just have a few more groups to go, which represent some of the most recently emerged and evolutionarily derived species in the Insecta class. Some of these final groups are relatively small, while others are quite large and diverse. For example, the Mycoteran order is very small, with just 600 species. The group is often called the scorpion flies, which refers to the largest family in the order, Panorpidae. These scorpion flies are so named because the males have large genitals that look kind of like a scorpion stinger. A smaller family in the order is the Batacidae, or the hanging scorpion flies. These have a really interesting mating ritual. The male will capture an insect and deliver it to the female as a mating gift in an attempt to woo her to mate with him, you know, showing off his hunting skills. According to a 2013 study on this mating phenomenon, females are more receptive to mating when this captured insect, this nuptial gift, if you will, is larger, perhaps because that demonstrates greater daring or vi vitality or ability in the male partner. You know, perhaps it demonstrates greater fitness and this encourages the female to mate with that particular male. 
Moving on, the Siphonotera order is also relatively small, with just 2,500 species. You might recognize these as the fleas. They're very small, parasitic insects that burrow into the flesh of their mammalian or bird hosts in order to drink their blood. The Stephanocercidae and the Ceratophyllidae families parasitize rodents, and the latter also parasitizes birds. The fleas of the Pulicidae family are notorious, not just because they frequently parasitize cats and dogs, but also because these were the fleas that carried the bacteria Yersinia pestis, which causes the bubonic plague. Speaking of disease-carrying pests, a group that's closely related to the scorpion flies and to the fleas is the Diptera order, better known as the flies. Unlike the previous groups, Diptera is absolutely massive, with an estimated one million species. Only a fraction of that has been discovered and described, but the fact that entomologists and evolutionary scientists estimate one million species just in this one order is amazing. Like, that's mind-boggling. The diversity there is incredible. And pretty much every subdivision of Diptera is also really diverse. For example, there's 2,500 species of sarcophagidae flesh flies, which deposit their larvae in rotting corpses or open wounds. The Foridae family has some 4,000 species, known for their fast running ability. The Surfidae family has some 6,000 species of flower pollinators. The Muscoidea superfamily contains about 7,000 species of flies, which include all manner of predators, parasites, shit-eaters, and scavengers. And the Empidoidea superfamily has approximately 10,000 mostly predatory species. The species of Diptera can also be really dangerous, because they often carry diseases. The Hippobuscoidea superfamily, for example, includes the dangerous Setse flies, which carry the protist Trypanosoma brucei, which causes the horrible disease known as sleeping sickness. And perhaps the most dangerous flies belong to the Sulicidae family, which you might recognize as the mosquitoes. It's kind of surprising that mosquitoes are technically a type of fly. It's true, but they are. Now, the mosquitoes carry all kinds of diseases, including malaria, Zika, West Nile, dengue, chikungunya, and many others, and they're believed to be responsible for more human deaths by acting as a vector for disease than any other animal in human history. On a much happier note, let's look at the Lepidotera order, which includes about 180,000 species of moths and butterflies. These insects have large, beautiful wings, which often have bright coloration, patterns, and or camouflage. They're particularly aesthetic animals, and the diversity and evolutionary ingenuity observed in their wing patterns is nothing less than amazing. They also have one of the more dramatic metamorphosis processes, wherein the larval caterpillar stage builds up a large cocoon, the caterpillar gets melted down into a biological goop, and then the entire body is reconstituted. It rebuilds itself into the mature butterfly form. The Lepidotera order includes the Agathophagidae family of cowrie moths, the Heterobathmiidae family of metallic moths, the small and primitive Microterygidae family, and the large and diverse Glossata suborder, which contains all of the superfamilies of moths and butterflies that can coil up their proboscis. One of the world's most famous butterflies is the beautiful monarch of the Nymphaliidae family, with its immediately recognizable black, white, and bright orange wings, and its famous intercontinental migration route that covers thousands of miles. Closely related to the Lepidotera are the caddisflies of the Trichotera order, comprising some 14,500 species. As larvae, they live in bodies of freshwater, where they provide a critical food source to larger insects, crustaceans like crayfish, as well as vertebrate fish and birds. As adults, some of the species eat nectar, but most species actually don't eat anything at all. For many of these caddisflies, the adult life stage is brief, 
It's meant only for rapid reproduction. They find a mate, they reproduce, and then they die. Once they reach sexual maturity, the entire focus of their life transforms into a speed run to reproduce before they die. All right, everyone. With this, we have come to the last order of the Insecta class. This is the order Hymenotera. It's a very large and very diverse order, with over 150,000 species. The singular trait that characterizes them all is that the females have a modified ovipositor that allows them to lay eggs inside of a host or some other specific place, like a narrow chamber in a nest or a hive. Sometimes, in some species, the ovipositor has been adapted into a stinger. The Hymenotera can be divided into two suborders, Symphyta and Epocrita. The Symphyta suborder includes almost 9,000 species of herbivorous sawflies and wood wasps. Most of them are herbivores, but the species of the Orosoidea superfamily are carnivores and will parasitize the larvae of jewel beetles, longhorned beetles, and other wood wasps. The other suborder, Apocrita, is incredibly huge and wildly diverse, as it contains all of the countless species of ants, bees, and wasps. There are far too many clades to exhaustively list, and even a quick summary would leave out so much. But that's really been kind of a running theme this whole episode, hasn't it? Well, let's give it a shot nonetheless. The bulk of the families within Apocrita are wasps, characterized by their ability to deliver potent and painful stings with their stinger of ovipositor. Among these many clades include the classic archetypical eusocial wasps of the Vespidae family, the hairy cow killer ants of the Mutility family, known for their extremely painful stings, the superfamily Ichneumonoidea, with some 100,000 species known for the extremely long ovipositors on the females, and the numerous parasitoid wasp clades which lay their eggs in some poor, hapless insect or arachnid host. These parasitoid wasps include the Chalcid superfamily of copper wasps, the Crassididae superfamily of desert-dwelling emerald wasps, and the Scoliidae and Pemphredoniani families of glossy black wasps. Within this stunning collection of wasp families, there's two groups that are a bit different. You have the 16,000 species of bees in the clade Anthophyla, and the estimated 22,000 species of ants in the clade Formicidae. Among the Anthophyla, there are families such as the ground-nesting Andrenidae, the common carpenter bees, bumblebees, and honeybees of the family Apidae, the primitive plasterer bees of the family Colettidae, and the large, very hairy, very fast Australian ground-nesting bees of the family Stenotridae. And among the ants of the Formicidae clade, there are subfamilies, such as the predatory subterranean Amblyoponini, which are called Dracula ants for their habit of drinking the hemolymph of their own larva, the even creepier Leptinillini ants, which feed their own larval hemolymph to their queen, the stink ants of the Dolocoderini family, which produce a foul odor when crushed, the slave-making ants of the Formicini family with their large venom glands full of formic acid, the Paraponera cravata bullet ants of the Paraponerini subfamily known for their extremely, unbelievably painful stings, and the Martialis eureka ants of the Martialini subfamily, recently discovered in the Amazon rainforest, but representing possibly the oldest lineage of living ants in the world. All right, everybody, that's it. We have reached the end of our tour through this huge and incredibly diverse clade known as Hexapoda. And with this, we come to the end of our mini-series on the arthropods, and the end of our series on the protostome side of the animal kingdom. This episode was pretty wild. It was really fun, and also really interesting. The hexapods are such a crazy group of animals, and no matter what order or family or subfamily you look at, there's always some wild, wicked, disgusting, or beautiful species to capture your attention. Now, if you thought this was fun, then get ready for the next series. 
Now that we're done with the protostomes, we'll be looking at the other half of the animal kingdom, the deuterostomes. These animals are much more familiar, but no less interesting. So that whole series is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be super exciting and extremely informative. Now, if you liked this episode, then hit that like button or give the show a five-star review. If you want to check out these upcoming episodes on the deuterostomes, then hit that subscribe button and hit the bell so you can see all of my new episodes right when I post them. You won't miss a thing. If you want to support the show financially, then check out the official store or consider supporting the show on Patreon. Our patron tiers start as low as $1 and $2 a month. And if I put out one show a month, well, that's about $1 or $2 a show. And if you think that's worth it, then go to the Patreon page and sign up at a, a tier of your choosing. Any way that you support the show, whether you like and subscribe to help us in the algorithm, or you buy something from the official store or support us on Patreon, everything you do keeps the show running, keeps the lights on, pays for hosting fees, pays for equipment, all that good stuff. I appreciate it like nothing else. I really do. It means so much to me. It's awesome. And as always, thanks for listening.